What Dr. Charles just did for us is outline for us brilliantly the essence of the just war tradition. Triangulated, pacifism on the one hand, uh, the crusade, jihadi, militarist, uh, going to war all the time, position on the other hand, and the just war tradition. And he said, listen, these two paradigms are idealists. Pacifists think they can achieve an ideal peace by laying down their weapons. The militarists think they can achieve an ideal peace by perpetually rooting out evil wherever it's found, wherever they think it's found, calling something evil and then going attacking it. But we don't live in an ideal world. We live in a real world. There won't be ideal justice until Christ returns. This all is a one-world government and a one-party system in which justice will roll down like the waters. And at that point, there will be an ideal uh, justice, but not until then. So that's the essence of the just war tradition. What I want to do, my talk will be really brief, I think around 10 minutes. And I want to just uh, um, talk about two sets of criteria that just war thinkers use to determine uh, justice and warfare. So the first are the uh, use ad bellum, and that means basically these are principles, um, criteria that you look at before going to war when you're deciding whether or not to go to war. And these criteria that I'll give you hang together. And together, all of them need to be taken together. Together, they let you know whether or not you're justified in going to war. Uh, then the second set of criteria are criteria for determining what is a just way to wage war. You know, there's a saying, all is fair in love and war. It's false. <laughs> uh, all is not fair in warfare. And so there's some things that are unfair and unjust and wrong to do. So let's start with um, uh, the principles for deciding whether or not to go to war. Now, I apologize. I'm going to have to be concise to the extreme. Okay, and a few qualifications. Just war thinkers will, there'll be a difference in how many numbers they have, the number of criteria they list. Usually though, that's just because, like I, I've got eight listed. Sometimes people will collapse the categories into one another. Uh, and so, but you'll get, you'll get different lists. I'm gonna list eight, and I'm building these off of the notes of my teacher, Dr. Heimbach. Um, and I'm gonna have to be concise to the extreme on this, but I'll try to kind of cut to the heart of it. And then we can, we can do recommended reading and we can talk about Dr. Charles's books and Dr. Heimbach's and some other ones later doing, during Q&A. So um, here we go. So the, the first one that we mentioned is just cause. There's gotta be a, a, a right um, a reason for entering the war. And as I define it, um, that a just cause is to correct a specific injustice or an injustice that you know will be committed. Like you've got actual intelligence, somebody's getting ready to attack or to uh, be an aggressor in a way that you need to be aggressive toward them. Say so to correct a specific injustice. Crusader isn't correcting a specific injustice. They're going after people because they want to change their ideology or their worldview or their religion. Um, they want to get evil and bad thinking wiped out off the face of the earth. So... Um, a lot more be, could be said, just cause. <laughs> a lot more could be said. Uh, number two, legitimate authority. That uh, the decision to go to war must be made by the political leader or the civic body who's responsible for the good of the people. Because hopefully, they're gonna be the ones who have the best interest of the population in mind. Now sometimes, um, it, sometimes, rarely, it can be legitimate for, uh, like in the case of a political revolution for lower level political leaders and a group of people in society to wage a civil war against higher leaders. We don't have a lot, of, I can't elaborate on that right now, but this, the general rule of thumb is that you're gonna have um, the political leaders who are elected or appointed um, who are in charge of the, the welfare of the people of order and security. Number three, right intent. Right intent and in warfare is to restore previous state of, uh, of peace. It's not to expand your te territory of your country, uh, to glorify your nation, to assert your dominance in the world, um, <clears throat> to keep your soldiers in practice for future wars. So we're going to have to find a, another intervention, a nation might say this decade, to keep our special operators in, in good war fighting shape. Uh, these are not, this is not right intent. Um, comparative justice. So nation A if nation A is gonna be justified in going to war against nation B, then they must have the, the majority of moral merit on their side. So in a given war um, uh, between nation A and nation B, nation A can be justified in going to war against nation B unless only if they've got most of the case on their side. For example, when the US went to war uh, against uh, Hussein, um, he had committed 
a grievous act. He had invaded another country's uh, territory and taken over. He had a little bit of moral merit, but not to do what he did. And it was that we're not quite sure why the border was drawn the way it was drawn between Iraq and Kuwait. And maybe historically Saddam is right that Iraq should own some of the territory that, that Kuwait now has. But he only had a little bit of a claim, and we had a big claim. By far more of the, of the moral merit on our side. Merit of justice. Last resort. We should go to war only after exhausting all realistic options. I want to stop here and point out that crusaders, militarists, and pacifists hijack just war criteria all the time and use it for their purposes. And that's because just war language is widely recognized, just war thinking is widely recognized to be the best thing going. I mean, I mean, this is this is the way to do it. And since and so you have pacifists who try to work toward a pacifist agenda by using just war criterion, and they'll use last resort and they'll stretch it and, and stretch it to such that it breaks. Such that there's actually nothing that could ever cause us to go to war. Um, but that's not what this principle is saying. It's saying that all realistic, reasonable options have been exhausted. Crusaders do this, do uh, do the same thing to principles, and I'll give an illustration of that in a moment. Uh, sixth, probability of success. So a nation, nation A needs to have a reasonable chance of success in order to go to war. Otherwise, they're just leading their soldiers to slaughter, right? It doesn't mean you have to think that you definitely will win or that clearly you will win. And you, you can even go to war as an underdog. But if you're going to war knowing that you're leading your soldiers to be slaughtered, uh, that's unjust. That's fundamentally um, uh, it's the, it's the wrong way to, uh, to handle it. Luke 14, 25 through 33, cost of discipleship, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Jesus actually uses as an analogy to make one of his points, uh, and he uses the analogy in a way that he's legitimizing this action. He says, isn't a king going to figure out if he's going to be able to win a war before he wages it? You know, what kind of a, a fool would go into war knowing that, that he's leading soldiers to uh, slaughter? Um, and you notice with these criteria, sometimes they're, they're not easy answers. Um, you're praying to God for wisdom because you're not exactly sure how things are going to pan out, right? We can't predict the future, but you have to have to give it your best shot. Seventh is proportionality of projected results. This means that the benefits must outweigh the costs. So if you look at how much it's going to cost you to go to war in terms of uh, lives lost, first of all, property lost, financial damage, um, are there are enough benefits to justify it. Or are you going to war over a, a relatively small matter that's not worth it? An eighth is right spirit, that we want to go to war with the spirit of regret rather than one of um, bloodlust or hatred or delight. President Bush, Bush 41, actually used that exact sort of, or almost exact uh, phrasing in his um, address to the nation. So these are the criteria, and they all hang together. If you mess with one of them, you mess with all of them. In other words, if you ignore just cause, but you adhere to all the rest, you've launched an unjust war. And so these, these hang together. Then we have uh, the, the use in bellow principles, and these are criteria for justice uh, while waging war. And uh, we'll tick through seven of those. And you'll notice that a lot of these are analogs to the criteria that we mentioned before going to war. Because if you are only give yourself permission to go to war according to certain criteria, those criteria are going to bear upon the way you wage the war or else you take what was an unjust launching of a war and you turn it into an unjust war. It doesn't make any, any sense. So the first principle that I'll mention is discrimination between combatants and non-combatants. And this is not the same, not exactly the same as a, a, a discrimination between soldiers and civilians because you can have civilians who become combatants one way or another either by carrying weapons or by assisting the military in a, in a war zone. Um, and so making distinction between combatants and non-combatants. Terrorists make this extremely difficult because they're uh, zealots, they're ideologues, and they're making an ideological point and they're wiping out evil. And they're going to wipe out not only the soldiers, but also civilians. And they, they're willing to wipe out their own civilians. And so terrorists hide behind civilians. They purposefully put weapon stockpiles inside of mosques, hospitals, uh, because they, they're, they're going to use our own wars against our, our own um, ethics, ethical rules against us. Um, have you seen Lone Survivor? Have you guys seen that movie? It's a classical example of, uh, of, uh, disc 
of, of how to handle this, where you've got Marcus Luttrell and three other soldiers of our special operators who were there in the mountains Af of Afghanistan, and they're about to strike a legitimate target, um, a, a terrorist and his his group, and uh, three or four goat herders uh, come up come upon him, and they're they're debating back and forth. The American soldiers are whether or not these guys are combatants, and uh, mm -hmm. three of them are saying, yeah, "I think they are. I think they are." But the guy who made the call said. Well, we can't prove it, and I'm not going to kill goat herders. And so, it turned out that one of the at least one of them was, and notified, went, went and immediately ran and, and told the the uh, I forget who the the terrorist was in in the camp there, and they came after our four men and, and killed three of them, and uh, one of them remained. And so, our special operators warfare is done mostly now through our um, intelligence agencies and our special operators. We engage in many wars because we don't. We want to avoid the threat of nuclear war, and our special operators have to make decisions on the moment. Often, they're not in contact with a, a battalion leader. You've got a small unit, Green Berets, 12 of them, almost every time, just 12. Navy SEALs, it'll be a different number, three or four, five or six a lot of times, and they have to make the decision on their own, sometimes in a split second, and without being able to consult with a, a commander. And so I think we need to have, uh, we need to pray for our, our, our warriors our special operators, and we need to educate the American public. And who better to do that than a bunch of people who love God and, uh, and I hope, uh, have an appropriate sort of affection for your country, even in spite of its flaws. Second principle is proportionality. And this one, this one's simple. Don't use more force than necessary to achieve legitimate goals. In the uh, book of Amos, God judges Damascus and Edom uh, for violating this. You know, if, uh, if, the enemy blows up one of our armored trucks. We don't firebomb their city, for example. Okay, so it's a proportion. Um, or, you know, blow up their government buildings, uh, all of them, or something like that. Uh, number three, avoidance of evil means. Um, I'm convinced that most Americans and maybe most Christians are utilitarian. And a utilitarian ethic just uh, says that we can kind of justify doing pretty much anything as long as the end objective puts us on God's side. But the Christian ethic has always been a principled ethic that says it's not okay to use evil means. God has never called us to win anything. He has called us to be obedient. Now, we do want to win when we're on the right side, but we can't break God's law in order, in order to win. So that's why our soldiers, our warriors should not rape pillage. They shouldn't burn the, 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 the food supplies, poison the drink supplies of the nations that they're fighting against, because why? Abuse these people who are usually being abused by the very political leaders that we are uh, having to, to, to fight against. Um, number four, good faith. Uh, treat enemy combatants as human beings, and sometimes that means killing them. But for example, when we have uh, uh, pris prisoners of war, um, the United States in our rules of engagement, these are, there's ROEs, rules of engagement. Every time our, our troops go to field, every time our special ops guys deploy, they have a specific ROEs for that mission. They're based on, there's kind of some universal rules of engagement, but there's also particular applications for each conflict or war. And, um, yeah, and so it, it, treating prisoner, prisoner, prisoners of war as humans is one of them. Now, there's some debate over enhanced interrogation techniques and torture and so forth. You guys are welcome to ask a question. Dr. Hambach's worked on that. You can ask him that question or, or Dr. Charles. Um, number five, probability of success. We need to stop fighting if success is futile. It goes for any nation. Why lead your, your people into a slaughter? There's no chance of winning it. Stop. Then a uh, similar um, principle is proportionality of... Uh, uh, projected results. We need to cease fighting if it becomes clear that a victory will cost us more than a more than walking away. Um, that's difficult, actually, to decide. The, the classic case of this was in World War One, the Battle of Somme, where um, the the Brits and the, as I like to call them, and the French lost about uh, I think it was I think six hundred thousand were killed. And another 400,000 were injured badly within the space of a few days, and they gained only six miles on the enemy. And most people would say that's a classic case of failing the proportionality of projected results, but there actually is an argument otherwise. When you view that battle within the context of the entire war, 
that that is actually what it took to win the whole war. I'm not going to make a call on it. Just trying to give you an example of how it's a difficult uh, decision to make. Number seven is right spirit. And that is that we continue to wage the war with regret instead of glee. War is a tragic necessity. And um, I don't have time to do it, but I brought some quotes and if I need to use them during Q&A, I can, where, where you've got some of our own nation's special operators articulating what it's like to try to be able to be the warrior they need to be, but not also to be uh, kind of unhinged, filled with hatred, and not to become bloodthirsty, especially when the people you're fighting against are people of, of bad will and who are indiscriminately killing uh, c- civilians and, and, and so forth, terrorists. So I have in mind, exactly who I have in mind there. So those are the, those are the um, sort of basic principles. Different just war thinkers will, have, will uh, have a shorter or longer list of principles, but usually, usually covering the same ground. And there are some disputes about these principles, um, uh, but we didn't have time to go into that tonight. Well, they've given us a lot to uh, chew on. Uh, and the, the two criteria we heard, uh, of course, uh, are the two, the two polar opposites is um, pacifism and jihadism or crusader. Um, let's just go ahead and ask the simple question, one that I hear often, and uh, maybe Dr. Heimbach, we'll hear from him on this one. Uh, and, fellas, you've got a mic there to share. Um, wasn't Jesus a pacifist, Dr. Heimbach? <laughs> Hello, is this on? Yes. Okay, uh, no, he wasn't a pacifist, but the uh, seriously, the the uh, tradition of Christian pacifism, one of the strongest, uh, or one of the most popular arguments that they like to make is that they want to be radical followers of Jesus, and uh, Jesus went to the cross very unjustly and refused to defend himself. And we should follow his example. Uh, talk about it as the way of the cross. And no matter what it costs, no matter what we lose, no matter how unjust it was, we should uh, never use force uh, to defend ourselves uh, or any cause um, because that's what Jesus did. And aren't you going to live like him? Well, I want to be very much like Jesus, but there are problems with that interpretation because. That, um, a lot of ways you can criticize that, but uh, the, I guess the first one I'll start with is that uh, that misinterprets Jesus' mission on earth. He came uh, to be a sacrificial lamb um, in obedience to the Father in order to be Savior of the world. Uh, he was not a victim. Uh, he was not caught off guard. Uh, he went to the cross on purpose, and if he had resisted, he would be failing his mission. And the, uh, the, the pacifists, some very well intended, are misinterpreting his mission as he didn't come to establish a pacifist ethic. He came to save um, sinners uh, from the wrath of God. An interesting corollary to that, uh, besides misinterpreting his mission, in a way that is inconsistent with the New Testament and church tradition, is that Jesus himself, uh, that uh, very same evening that he was arrested uh, the day before, then he was uh, crucified, known as the Last Supper, uh, he, one of the things that uh, he addressed is how his disciples should behave after he, uh, after he died and uh, went back to heaven, and he, you know, he'd been very specific that he, they were going to be arrested, going to be uh, killed, and uh, going to rise from the dead, and then he was going to leave uh, for heaven, and they were going to be on their own, and so forth like this. Uh, and in the process of that, he uh, wanted to correct their, their, the lesson, uh, their interpretation of the lesson they were supposed to, to uh, uh, take from uh, the way that he had uh, trained them on mission trips. He'd sent them on mission trips a couple times and uh, had sent them out without any supplies, without any money, without any extra clothes, without uh, any uh, provisions. And uh, they were to 
um, trust God to provide for their provisions supernaturally and, um, and the hospitality of uh, people that they, uh, in the towns that they went to. And he said, how did that, how did that go? How did that work? It went great. You know, God supplied all their needs. He said, um, but after I leave, when you go on trips, particularly if you go on mission trips, um, you need to take the normal precautions. You need to, you know, pack your, pack your bags and take a, you know, take your supplies and take your, take a money bag and uh, take weapons for defense. Uh, take swords, which was uh, weapons of deadly force in those days because there was no uh, police force in the country and uh, you had to be the police force defending yourself, even at the point of using deadly force against uh, those who were attacking you. So he, he had told his disciples, even if it was a mission trip, they should take weapons of deadly force with the idea that they might have to use them at some time. And he told them that just a couple of hours before uh, they uh, went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then uh, he was arrested. And, of course, he rebuked Peter's use of the sword. So, so Jesus' rebuke of Peter's use of the sword wasn't a change of the ethic of uh, force. Uh, not merely was it a change with regard to government. It was, uh, you know, wasn't even a change with regard to you know, personal self-defense because um, uh, he, was, he was telling Peter, you don't... You don't use uh, deadly force for, to uh, spread the gospel. You don't uh, do it to promote the mission of the church. Um, but he was uh, not prohibiting them from using uh, swords even in self-defense because he just told them that. Thank you. Um, and be thinking of questions. Uh, Kimberly is over here. And uh, she's got a microphone, so you raise your hand, and we'll make sure that if you've got a question, just say your name, and we'll take your question. Uh, while, while we're doing that, yes, uh, Dr. Charles. I was just going to piggyback on, as we're talking about Jesus, uh, his mission, uh, which Professor Heimbach clarified. What often receives very short shrift is um, Jesus' view of the <clears throat> centurion. I think it's recorded in Matthew 8. Uh, he takes a, an officer in the Roman legions and he uses him as the paradigm for faith. Do you recall what he says? Nowhere in all of Israel have I seen faith like this. Now, he could have said, you know, I commend you for your faith, but geez, find another job. You know? <laughs> or you're missing it. A true discipleship will call you into another profession. No. Uh, that's not an argument from silence, as many pacifists would say. Uh, let's back up a half step. John the Baptist. Only Luke, in a tantalizing way, uh, tells us that several soldiers come in a time of repentance, a context of repentance, change of heart, right? And uh, what, are the, what do the soldiers ask? You know, what must we do? To which the Baptist responds, what? A twofold response. Get out of the Roman legions. And, no. Be content with your wages and treat other people justly. Wow. Boy, did Jesus miss a great opportunity. May I add to that one? <laughs> I, I've got to add to that one because I, I talk about it in class quite a lot. But um, it's e that's very often dismissed as a... Um, Argument from silence. Jesus, he doesn't specific. He just told him to, you know, to uh, to to behave nicely and to be, don't complain about their pay. But that's not saying that their profession is legitimate. Wait a minute. He answered in a way that presumed there's nothing wrong with serving as soldiers in the military if you do it right. Um, and the reason you know that is if you substitute a profession that is inherently sinful. See, the, the pacifists are, are saying serving in the military, being a soldier, doing what soldiers do uh, when they have to do it is itself sinful, is an inherently sinful profession. Um, well, what's an inherently sinful profession? Being a professional prostitute. So the way he, you know, way he answered those, those two, sol two soldiers was, 
Let's say there were two prostitutes, and that's all we know about them. They're professional prostitutes. Two professional prostitutes came to Jesus and said, what do we need to do to, uh, to reform our lives and live in a way that's ready for the Messiah? If he said, well, uh, don't overcharge your customers and, uh, and practice it fairly. Uh, no. I mean, the, uh, that, he wouldn't answer that way because answering that way is presuming there's nothing wrong with the profession. So that's the way Jesus answered, I mean, answered those soldiers. He answered in a way that presumed there's nothing inherently wrong with being a soldier. That's a vivid illustration. Maybe we could say, you know, if they were two hit men or something. <laughs> Kimberly, uh, what questions do we have? Kimberly's uh, got the mic. Uh, say your name and, and uh, ask your question. Um, hi, my name is Janet McKay. I live here locally. There are a couple of debate clubs here of high school students, if you haven't noticed. I'm embarrassing them all right now. But we're here because this year, we're part of a national uh, Christian forensics league, and this year the resolution is dealing with the ethics of preventive war. Um, which is a relatively new thing. And so we wondered if you could speak to the just cause, the last resort principle, anything that, that you've come across with the relatively new idea of preventive war. And by the way, can I just say, we will be debating this resolution in Cary in March and in Youngsville in April, if anybody wants to come and watch. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. And judge. Yeah, we need to judge. Yes. Thank you. Actually, I'm very curious as to what... Um, Dr. Charles would answer, but uh, I guess you want me to address this. Uh, Michael Walser addresses this in, uh, in his book very well, I think, and in a way that uh, I think has been overlooked by a number of Christian, well-meaning Christian ethicists who just haven't thought as carefully about it as, uh, as he did or he has. Um, and uh, he makes the distinction and argues as part of the just war tradition. It's a question of interpretation using uh, the, the term preventive war. Uh, it really uh, comes down to proper interpretation of the just cause principle. And um, it is, it is uh, a, um, a stretch, an improper interpretation of just cause principle to... Um, argue as just cause uh, a reason to attack the enemy if they actually haven't done anything wrong to you. So uh, the way Augustine put it, uh, to have just cause, your enemy must be sinning, uh, i.e. against you. Uh, not against somebody else, but against you as an international ethic. So uh, if the enemy isn't you know, just out of fear of what the enemy might do, is not just cause, because he actually hasn't done anything wrong. You're just afraid that he could. So the uh, distinction that needs to be made um, is uh, between preemptive war and preventive war. And um, preventive war is, not, is outside the just war tradition, and preemptive war is. Uh, the difference between prevention and preemption, prevention is when you are arguing your reason for going to war is to prevent or stop the enemy from doing something you fear he could do. You know, he's got stockpiles, he's got troops on the border, uh, but he actually hasn't uh, declared war, he actually hasn't done anything wrong, he's inside his own country. Uh, whatever, you're just afraid that, you know, he's going to use his, use his weapons. Um, preemptive war is where you, the enemy has actually done something, started a, uh, an action against you, but you haven't experienced the uh, harmful effect yet. They fired the missile, but it hasn't landed. Or... The terrorists uh, plot you, you know, toward the terrorists. Well, plot. you Would that you, be an you inter well terrorists don't uh, represent a government unless you talk about terrorist regimes. But but because um, they're separate, uh, it, it, it's a confusing category. Are they a government or not? But that that's that's going in a different direction. Um, preemptive war is where the enemy has started an action. Uh, you know, like say you have intercepted. A, um, an attack order um, 
So the so they've already the, the 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 troops on the other side have already been ordered to attack. You know that because you've intercepted the communication, but they haven't uh, they haven't fired a shot yet. But they've actually been sent. They've actually been ordered to war, and so it's started. The enemy's already initiated the action, and so you uh, you then take action to attack them before they you know are ready because. They've already been ordered to attack. So the uh, that's just an illustration of an you know that's that's a, a preemptive action, which is uh, within the traditional interpretation of just cause, and preventive is not. Dr. Charles, you want to add anything to that? Dr. Charles might have another interpretation. Let's see what he no. Nope. You want to you want to try with this, Dr. Ashford? Well, a couple things that came to mind. I mean. In the, in the crusader mentality, <clears throat> there's always a pre preventive war to be waged. There's always evil. And uh, you're, so you're waging war on many different fronts all the time. War is endless. So that's one thing. When you open the door to preventive warfare, you al it also means that the most powerful nation in the world gets to determine who's evil and who's not. They haven't done anything wrong yet, but they're bad. And they have to be, they have to be taken out. And so uh, one day that won't be the U.S., It'll be somebody else. <clears throat> what, do we, what do we want? And, and they're going to have a different view of what's, what's right or wrong. And, and what if the shoe were on the other foot? And uh, what if they realized that we had uh, taken the lives of 60 to 70 million unborn human beings in the past 50 years? Then, uh, so as a, the general rule here is not to violate uh, sovereign, uh, the sovereignty of other nations. Um, the other thing is this, a lot of times a war that is argued on preventive grounds didn't need to be argued on preventive grounds. Well, um, the second Gulf War, Dr. Heimbach argued that in his essay, that uh, it was justified based on the fact that Sodom uh, broke his treaty over and over again. And uh, so, so often you can find a way. And then finally, um, Dr. Heimbach made a good point. The words preventive and preemptive are used in very uh, confusing overlapping and even antithetical manners. What one person means by preventive, another, uh, another person does not mean the same thing. So you have to clearly define your terms when you, when you get down to this debate that you're, that you're gonna be in. Very good. Next question, we have a hand over here. Kimberly, say your first name. My name is Scott, I uh, live here locally. Um, and um, I have a question with language, what you were talking about. Uh, Dr. Charles, you mentioned about the false dichotomy between secular and sacred. And then we also have uh, words such as justice, um, force, and violence. You mentioned that earlier. In a world that's increasingly diverse, how do we land on a solid ground? How do we land in a place where just war means just war? Uh, and the reason I ask that question is, is we have allies such as, we'll use Saudi Arabia as an example. When we talk about justice, we mean one thing. When we talk about justice with our ally in Saudi Arabia, they'll say another. But we're justifying going to war with those particular allies who are very different. Dr. Charles, you want to try that one? <laughs> yeah. Well... That's a great question, and and uh, there are com uh, it's filled with complexity. Uh, I and I grant that Saudis and Westerners or North Americans view life in different ways. They use a different language. They have uh, different belief systems. But I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that there's a denial of justice at a fundamental level. If that were the case, there'd be no, there'd be no room, there'd be no possibility for foreign affairs, there'd be no possibility for diplomacy. If there's no, what I'm getting at is, if there's no shared moral ground between human beings, regardless of culture, regardless of religion, if there's no shared humanity, which inform which inform our our informs our understanding of justice, then it's going to be hard to get to first base. But 
I'm one of those who would argue, yes, that based on the natural law, that is to say, the law written on the heart, that which all people, as one philosopher describes it, that which we can't not know. There is something called criminal justice in Saudi culture. Now, it's tainted by their religious view of reality. <laughs> but I do believe, nonetheless, their uh, justice takes on a character so that Saudi Arabia can uh, have relations with other nations. <laughs> that can't be rooted just in Islam. Otherwise, they would have no uh, foreign relations with nations outside of the Middle East. So that's, the, that's a tall order for a diplomat, is it not, for those who are uh, negotiating. But it seems to me that there, is, there are realms of common ground. And that's why the tradition itself does, is not just a Christian thing. <laughs> One might have gotten the impression tonight from comments made that the just war tradition is just this religious category. No, it's a description of moral reality. And moral reality grounds all people regardless of their cultures. Now, if you're hearing by, thereby that I'm saying it's easy or it translates easily, no, not at all. Uh, but that's why government service, that's why diplomacy, uh, that's why policy are so important because uh, that's why they're, they're necessary. That's why that's sacred. <laughs> Those vocations are sacred. They're difficult. They're complex. But they require an understanding, it seems to me, of human beings, human nature, as well as culture, uh, that look for common ground without necessarily compromising on, on moral matters that are non-negotiable. But outside of that, I don't have, I, I'm probably not satisfying you with my answer. Uh, but I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll piggyback on that. Susan, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the just war ethic or just war tradition is uh, a real, a, a real world ethic, a realist ethic, not a perfectionist ethic. And um, in a real world, uh, everything's less than perfect. And when you are trying to uh, fight wars or you're planning to fight wars with different allies, and I mean, even even within commanders in a single army, you're going to have different interpretations, different uh, mm -hmm. levels of understanding, different feelings and of motivations. Uh, and so, um, one, the decision, you know, the, how you interpret it is ultimately on the shoulders of the commander. Uh, should be the head of state, but if he's, if it may be the, gen, you know, the, the, the general in charge on the ground or whatever. And if you're working with allies, and you're deciding whether we are going to use this procedure, that procedure, or whether we're going to attack, you know, because uh, we're, we're in the ready, but we're not starting it yet. Um, and you're, you're thinking your way through just cause. Um, then uh, if, you're the, if you're the chaplain and you're giving advice on just war interpretation, then you should give your best moral advice to the decision maker but then he's going to have to make his decision based on your advice. Um, but if you're if you're an al if you're a commander of a, of a U.S. unit and you're working with a Saudi unit, um, you can talk about it, but you have to take responsibility yourself. You can't be responsible for their interpretation. You're you're responsible for the interpretation of the joint force that you're over, and they're just going to have to cooperate with what you say the cause is. One more question, right here. Uh, my name is Mitch, and I'm a student here. Uh, so I'm wondering, how would the just war theory apply to the situation of advanced interrogation techniques like torture, especially in relation to like the Imago Dei of a person, even in the times of war? Hmm. Dr. Heimbach, do you want to try that one? On enhanced interrogation and techniques, waterboarding and the like. And tell them where they can find your article. And tell them where you can, they can find your article. Well, I've got all the lecture notes upstairs. <laughs> um, where is that article? I forget where it got published. Anyway, <laughs> it's, it's been a while ago. 
I well, I I uh, organize a whole um, uh, session at the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society debating this, uh, and we had folks representing different uh, points of view on it, and I tried to reconcile them, but um, my uh, after reading through all the literature and the you know the emotional things that people were saying, uh, I. Uh, concluded that actually the problem was with the definition of torture because uh, people weren't really disagreeing. Nobody was saying we should treat um, enemy prisoners immorally. Uh, nobody was denying that they should be interrogated and sometimes you, and sometimes it's hard, uh, you get non-cooperating um, prisoners. Most prisoners are non-cooperating uh, if they're trying to get intelligence out of them. Um, and so uh, no one really uh, was against, you know, maybe, uh, you know, talking to them with a, with a stern voice or uh, having them miss a meal or maybe, uh, you know. The thing is that... Uh, the level of, con it's a continuum. There, there is a continuum from, from nothing and acting like a pal to, you know, uh, uh, putting someone to a very torturous, slow death. Um, and so the question is when, uh, when is it, when is, when are the stakes justified? When is it, uh, when, uh, is there any other way? Uh, to, to get the same information without doing this. Uh, you know, how many lives are at stake? Do we really know this guy knows the information or not? You know, so you don't want to use, you know, you know, enhanced techniques on somebody you don't even know if he knows the information. So you don't even know that if he makes up, comes up something, is he making it up just to get you off his back or is he given real information? If you're just fishing, you don't really know. But that, it's a very different situation if you know that you've caught the guy that just planted a nuclear device, you know, in a, nu in a, uh, a New York City subway station that's going to go off and kill 15 million people, you know, in the next 55 minutes. And, you, you know, this is the guy who had it because, you know, he's got the backpack and it's uh, radioactive and, and uh, you know, you, people saw it. You just don't know where it is. So you know the guy knows where it is. And you know you only have a certain amount of time, and you know that uh, you know it's his life against uh, or, or his comfort against uh, the lives of 15 million people. Uh, you're going to go a lot farther down that line if he tells you, you know, when you're smiling and nice, then great. But you're going to keep you know, going farther and farther and farther uh, until he reaches a point where he decides he's going to give you the information that you need to save the 15 million people. So, uh, what's torture? Is torture just making him uncomfortable? Is torture using force out of proportion? Uh, so, uh, that's why people use other names like uh, enhanced interrogation techniques, because that puts it in objective terms, and then you can talk about the ethics of it and how far you go. Because if you're, if you're talking to somebody for whom torture is defined, as using uh, as as uh, as sinful action, then there's no way it's ever justified. So, um, but the, eth the the actual ethical paradigm that both sides are working on is actually pretty much the same. They're just defining terms differently. So sometimes you know the debate is, uh, you know, and they really just want to beat up on a, on on political opponents. They don't want to actually have uh, an an informative moral discussion. Hmm. All right. Uh, yes, I, go I ahead, Dr. Like Charles. To add to, yeah, uh, th that's a great point. It's a continuum, isn't it? Not. Look, those of you who are parents, well, now, if you're not a parent, picture your parents. There was a continuum in the discipline that they used in your life, was there not? Just think earlier. And it was from, Jenny, don't do that. Please don't swap my hand again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's disproportionate. <laughs> To Johnny, do not do that again. To Johnny, 
<laughs> Please don't do that again. <laughs> Dude, Johnny, you're out of the house. But see, that's at age 18 or 21. See, that was not a three-year-old or four-year-old. See, it's a continuum, is it not? Love, back to, and I, yours is such a great question. And you qualified it, you used the language image of God. Thank you. Look, there is this sense, even among religious people, and, and I appreciate uh, the, uh, Professor Hambach's comment that it's hard for us, it's hard for religious believers to talk about this very issue because of, of uh, uh, everything is fraught with emotional baggage and garbage and what have you. But uh, C.S. Lewis in uh, this wonderful little essay titled uh, a the-, the Theory of Humanitarian Punishment, I think, basically argued this. If we really love, because we're made in the image of God and we love other people, we hold them accountable for their actions. <laughs> if you're a parent, you know that. And if you don't love the child, you will not hold the child accountable. Can we say that? Okay. So image of God, image bearers, morally accountable. Therefore, the loving thing to do is to hold other image bearers accountable for their actions. Extend it from the household, parenthood, to society, criminal justice, to international affairs, terrorism. It seems to, seems to me our theology can help guide us without our emotions getting in the way. So it seems to me we can hold people accountable, but when, as was eloquently stated, we don't, there's a lot that we don't know, we have to find that out. Is that wrong to try to find it out? What does enhanced mean? Your parent just went from, Johnny, don't do that, to... Johnny, you will not do the, that again to Johnny out of the house. That's a continuum. And I would argue that all of those steps can be done, even the final, even saying, Johnny, I support the authorities to put you in jail because I couldn't do it. Your mother and I tried. You see, that's a continuum. And I would say love can stand behind every one of those. So now if you're asking, well, Daryl, could you be an enhanced interrogator? You know, I'm not saying, I'm not sitting here saying boldly I could and look that person. Yeah, who probably, we're going on intel, aren't we? Okay, so we're not just going on guesses. So we're going on intel, what we know or what is reasonably certain. Seems to me love and charity can try to get to the truth and uphold the truth. Because guess what? Love is not just looking this person who's an image bearer in the eye. It's also love is concerned about the hundred, the thousand, the p potential victims. Yes, that's part of love too. And so that's why putting a, and you know, I don't assume that we all agree on this. This is my position. So I, I allow for, I have no qualms as a Christian by saying Christian love can put to death by means of criminal justice and proper authority an evildoer. It would never have been done among the covenant people of God if that were against God's character. All right. And again, we noted cities of refuge were meant to discern between manslaughter, homicide, and murder of the innocent. So it seems to me the murder of innocent or the potential murder of the innocent gives up his or her right to live. That's love. That's moral reality. That's based on God's design. Now, can that be abused? Of course. You're worried, hey, gee, Daryl, you're just opening things up for grand abuse. Well, no. Uh, some have to make those difficult decisions. Now, thankfully, we don't every day. But there are those who do, and I'm glad they're there. Uh, my oldest is a professional uh, therapist, and in the last 10 years or so, I think I've come to appreciate her work a heck of a lot more because I was much more simplistic in how I, how I viewed dealing with evil, helping people with deep, uh, uh, tyrannized by personal bondage. Hey, as a therapist, how deep do you go? What will love, how, how deep will love go to enter that person's life, to break those chains. You see? Ha! Huh. So it seems to me even a psychologist, even a therapist can use, quote unquote, advanced interrogator methods.
So drawing the line is very difficult. And the point made here is just cannot be uh, overestimated. It really is, is critically important. I could add to that how to draw the line. I think the answer to that is, is relying on just war principles. Uh, let's say, uh, how far do you go? Well, you consider likelihood of success. Do we know, does this guy know, is, is he the one responsible? Does he know the information or do we just, uh, we just have any, we're just guessing. Uh, proportional use of force. You don't use more force to make him talk than you have to. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, just cause, uh, all of those. So you can, those principles can help you analyze how you step it up. Um, but back to the issue of uh, made in the image of God. Um, that is critically, obviously critically important, uh, particularly for a Christian, but I think for anybody. But it is, um, we need to interpret it biblically and not in a, a humanistic, uh, imaginary, self-interpreted way. Um, because although the image of God means that uh, this is a human being and not an animal, uh, that also means that we need to treat the person as a responsible moral agent and not a machine, and therefore someone who is responsible for his or her actions and needs to be, and uh, and therefore someone who uh, can be held accountable for that, and not just simply say, "Well, you know, you were tired, or you were, uh, you know, you were abused." So, uh, trying to make an excuse for it, you are responsible. You have a conscience. You. You, uh, you know right and wrong. Um, but this, it, it has to do with the proper interpretation of the sanctity of human life, right? And um, there is a very interesting, little discussed verse in Scripture. Most of us are Bible students here, this being seminary and all. In Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel 13, 9. Of, uh, that's just trying to remember from memory. Uh, in which God, who is the... Um, the one in whose image we are made, and uh, whose ethic it is, is criticizing um, religious leaders of the day for misinterpreting the sanctity of human life ethic. And God says there's two ways. You are, you are lying to my people. Uh, that is, you're telling a moral lie. You're twisting uh, a moral claim uh, on the sanctity of human life in two ways. One by killing those who should not die. Well, we're used to that, you know, shedding innocent blood. Sanctity human life means you don't kill those who shouldn't die. And not killing those who should die. So, the, so God says you're violating the sanctity human life ethic when you don't kill someone who forfeits their right to life. So the, uh, the murderer or, you know, the enemy combatant uh, does not have according to God, uh, an inherent right to life. It is subject to the conditions that God gives. And if you have wrongly taken the life of another, you no longer have a moral right to your own life. You have forfeited that. Because your life, the, the life of the victim, is not worth less than the life of the murderer. 